So good morning, everybody. And welcome to our press conference on the 2019 Schweppe results and with our chair, Andrea Enria. Without any further ado, I will hand over to him to take the floor. Please, Andrea. Thank you very much, Connie, and uh, uh, welcome to all of you to our press conference on the supervisory review and evaluation process, the SREP, which is our main supervisory tool. Uh, the SREP allows us to spot weaknesses in the banks and take measures to address them through capital add-ons, such as the Pillar 2 requirements and guidance, as well as through qualitative measures. The SREP is a well-established tool. We have been using it since ever European banking supervision was established. Yet so far, we have only published broad aggregate outcomes. But today, as part of our ongoing drive to achieve greater transparency, we are publishing more granular results, more details on the SREP methodology, and the list of individual banks' Pillar 2 requirements, or P2R. The outcome of the SREP uh, cycle, of the 2019 SREP cycle, uh, whether in the form of capital add-ons or qualitative measures, applies to the banks in 2020. Um, in this presentation, I will focus on four main points. First, the higher level of transparency as an important objective of ECB supervision. Second, the stabilization of the supervisory requirements set by ECB. Third, the areas of supervisory concerns in the SREP 2019, in particular internal governance and operational risk and profitability and business model sustainability. And uh, finally, the, uh, the, progress in the, uh, the progress achieved in the risk reduction agenda, so in the, in the, in the improved uh, asset quality, in the reduction of non-performing loans. Let me start with transparency. For the first time ever, we are publishing individual Pillar 2 requirements. And we are very pleased that 188 out of the 109 banks we examined in this rep cycle have consented to have their P2R published on our website one year earlier than required by the revised capital requirements regulation. Uh, let me give you maybe a little bit of uh, explanations here. Uh, this does not uh, cover the full set of 117 banks, significant institutions under our direct supervision. Uh, besides the bank that didn't uh, uh, consent to publication, we also have other eight banks for which the Pillar 2 uh, are, uh, are not available uh, because uh, either the, 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 the banks became significant throughout 2019. For instance, this covers uh, banks that uh, relocated business uh, to the euro area as a result of Brexit, like uh, JP Morgan, uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, uh, UBS, and others. Uh, or because the SREP decision has been postponed. And this is the case, for instance, for Nordel Bay or Carige, for which there was a significant capital increase in the last days of last year. Um, the publication of individual SREP outcomes will shed more light on the state of European banks, which should help <laughs> banks to compare their own position with that of their peers and allow investors to take more informed decisions. Hopefully, uh, the enhanced disclosure uh, by ECB supervision will also allow market participants to better understand what we do, so, let's say, our, our, our work, our methodologies, and make our actions more predictable. Let's now look at the actual results. Uh, starting with the big picture, the Common Equity Tier 1 capital, CET1, uh, requirements and guidance remain stable at 10.6% as the previous year. This confirms the stabilization in the supervisory assessment of banks' capital needs. I want to stress this point because sometimes out there there is this narrative that uh, uh, supervisory requirements are stabilizing in uh, all other jurisdictions, in the US, in the UK, in East Asia, while they, are, they keep going up and up in the, in the, in the euro area. And uh, let's say the evidence we presented showed that this is not the case. Uh, the fact that we have, uh, on average, uh, stable uh, requirements doesn't mean that the individual outcomes are the same. Uh, they, they, uh, they vary, indeed, uh, reflecting changes in the underlying risk profile of the banks. And the overall requirements and guidance change, for instance, in one uh, every three banks, going up in 15% of cases and down in another 15%. On average, P2R is higher as the score worsens. On a scale of one to four, the higher the score, the riskier the banks, and the higher the capital add-ons. And you have a lot of details in our methodology booklet published today on how the scores are, are prepared and calculated. 
Looking at business models, it is the first time also we give a breakdown of the results by business models. Uh, globally systemically important banks, the GCIPs, face low and the universal banks, face lower pillar two guidance, P2G, reflecting higher resi resilience in stress test exercises. The P2G is the component of the, uh, uh, that uh, basically reflects the stressed, uh, the stressed uh, uh, conditions. In terms of overall uh, CT1 requirements, including also the systemic buffers, GCIPs are at a comparable level to that of banks with other business models. So basically, when you look also at the systemic footprint, at the potential impact of the uh, of problems at banks, uh, let's say the buffers that cover for that uh, compensate for the uh, lower uh, buffers uh, under the Pillar 2 guidance. The upcoming revision of the European Banking reg uh, Regulation will allow banks to fulfill Pillar 2 requirements partly with capital of lower quality than Common Equity Tier 1, than CT1. According to our calculations from 2021 20, onwards, so not for this year, CT1 requirements will thus fall by around 90 basis points as a consequence of this reform. This is not something that we supported when the, uh, let's say, when the legislative debates were ongoing, uh, because uh, we always thought it would have been better to fulfill the Pillar 2 requirements with uh, a higher quality of capital that is able to absorb losses in an ongoing concern basis. But that's the, that has been the decision of the legislators, so we will fully abide with it. Um, Almost all banks have adequate level of capital in excess of all requirements, including the systemic and counter cyclical buffers. Uh, at the end of the third quarter of 19, that's important, so the latest uh, capital figure that we have, so September 2019, six banks had capital levels below the Pillar 2 guidance set for 2020. In four cases, that shortfall had already been remedied by the end of 2019. The two remaining banks have been requested to take remedial actions uh, within a well-defined timeline. Capital requirements and guidance are not the only outcome of this rep. As I already mentioned, there are also qualitative measures, very important to us, or in other words, actions that banks are asked to take in order to fix issues that we have identified in this rep process. Altogether, 91 banks received qualitative measures in the 2019 SREP, only slightly more than in 2018. And the distribution of qualitative measures shows that supervisory concerns are particularly focused on the area of internal governance. Almost a third of all remedial actions to be taken by banks relate to their governance. Indeed, the SREP scores for internal governance worsened across all business models, continuing a trend uh, seen already in previous years. Three out of four banks, 76%, up from 67% in 2018, scored three, so medium high risk. Only 18% of banks achieved the score of two, down from 25% in 2018. Digging a bit deeper, qualitative measures aim to address severe weaknesses in the internal control functions of banks, lack of effectiveness in their management bodies, and deficiencies in their risk management, including sound risk data aggregation capabilities. And that's a point that surprised me, I must say, in my first year at the ECB, how many of the findings also in our inspections deal with uh, uh, data issues, data quality issues, data aggregation capabilities. That's an area which is sometimes a litmus test of uh, greater problems in the banks. Moreover, remuneration schemes are often designed in a way that places too much weight on short-term profitability and not enough weight on long-term sustainability. Finally, controls and procedures regarding anti-money laundering are still insufficient. In short, we are particularly concerned about governance, and weak governance can be the source of many other issues in a bank. Take operational risk as an example. The outcome of this rep in this area is worse than last year, and most operational losses stem from the materialization of conduct risk, which can often be traced back to governance issues. The deterioration of scores for operational risks also reflect the fact that IT and cyber risks have increased for a number of banks. Thus, in 2020, we will maintain a heightened focus on such risks by carrying out on-site inspections dedicated to IT. In addition, the harmonized cyber incident reporting framework will increase our knowledge about cybersecurity breaches, clearly an area that banks need to work on. 
Another prominent area of supervisory concern is the low level of profitability of European banks. Many of them do not earn their cost of capital, as is shown in this, in this chart. Uh, cost of capital even measured according to banks' own estimates, which in our view are a little bit optimistic. And this is reflected, of course, in low valuations, low, spri low price to books for European banks. From a supervisory perspective, this means low organic generation of capital and lower capacity to raise equity in markets under challenging economic conditions. So that cannot be good also from a supervisory perspective. Banks tend to blame the lack of profitability on external conditions, pointing to negative interest rate policies, stringent regulatory requirements, tougher competition, including from fintech companies, um, and sluggish growth in the euro area. And all this is true. It is undeniable that the environment in which banks operate is challenging, but this is not going to change in the short term. So banks need to sharpen their managerial efforts to refocus their business model, deploy effective strategies on digitalization, and achieve more radical improvements in cost efficiency. I believe that consolidation could also prove helpful in achieving these goals. Um, there is still a lot of excess capacity in the European banking sector, one of the legacy of the crisis still. This is why one of our priorities this year is to assess banks' failure, banks' future resilience and sustainability of their business models. And we may well consider stepping up supervisory pressure if banks' self-help self measures are not effective enough. Let me now move to the last point on asset quality. Uh, progress continues to be made in the post-crisis cleaning of banks' balance sheets. When the ECB took over banking supervision in 2014, non-performing loans, NPLs, in the euro area stood at around 1 trillion uh, euros, 8% of total loans. Since then, we have taken various measures, and the banks have put a lot of work into bringing down NPLs. And these efforts have been successful. Since 2014, the volume of NPLs has shrunk by almost half to 540 billion, and the NPL ratio has fallen to 3.4%. Looking ahead, the volume of NPLs is expected to decrease further in line with the targets banks have agreed with their supervisors. When we look at the strategies, high NPL banks, let's say the, the, the banks with high NPLs, uh, we see that's why what also explains the difference in the figures. You see, we have 543 billion uh, outstanding non performing loans. The 279 billions that you see on the right hand side of the chart is, uh, are, are the non performing loans at high NPL banks for which we ask specific strategies to be in place. And we see that they are bringing down, they plan to bring down their NPLs by another 35% over the next two years. And what is more important is that this plan reduction targets in particular very old vintages of NPLs, which tend to be the most difficult to cure or dispose of. So banks are on the right track when it comes to asset quality, but as REP decisions recommend that banks with high NPLs maintain a strong focus on achieving their targets and continue improving their risk profile. It is crucial that the banks' uh, balance sheets are cleaned up before the next recession hits. In order to prevent future builds up, banks will have to pay close attention to their credit underwriting standards. The ECB is currently reviewing market practices in this area and will soon come up with the findings, our preliminary findings of this uh, very important strand of work. Regarding risk to liquidity, overall scores show that banks have good liquidity position. 76% of the banks have a score of 2, 70%, up from 70% in 2018, and four banks scored 1, down from 12 in 2018. This is also in line with the good results of the liquidity stress test that we published uh, uh, in the last uh, autumn, uh, which was also a main input in the in this rep uh, process. Uh, many significant institutions have missed their own funding plan targets, also due to their changed expectations on monetary conditions. So the, the condition changed, so is not something that at the moment, uh, let's say, concerns us that much, although, let's say, as the EBA also flagged, uh, uh, banks can uh, and should probably step up their ability to set and respect their funding targets. And now I'm looking forward to answering your questions. Thank you.
Thank you very much. So can I ask you to wait for that? We're going around the room. We'll start here. And can you please introduce yourself, just because we don't do this very often. So I think it's on. Just. My name is Saranta Iñiguez, Spanish Press Agency, EFE. I have two questions. Uh, you are talking about a low, a low profili uh, um, profitability <laughs> of the banks. Well, the interest rates are at 0% and uh, in negative um, um, area. So in which extent is the ECB also a part of the problem? And you introduced um, a tier system. This, this system helped to, to improve the profitability, uh, profitability of the banks. Could you quantify how much? And my second question is, can we take conclusions about countries if we see that the banks in a country have um, a higher uh, pillar to uh, percent request? Um, can we take conclusions about the risks of the banks concerning growth in the country or something like that? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Well, uh, first of all, the interest rate policy, uh, of course, uh, the negative interest rate policy has an impact on uh, bank margins, but it has also positive effects on, uh, on banks' balance sheets. It, uh, um, of course, uh, with the low interest rates, it's more likely that uh, borrowers pay back their, their loans, and, uh, and it is easier for banks uh, to uh, uh, let's say, manage their and dispose uh, their, their non-performing loans. So probably the major progress which has been achieved in the area of asset quality would not have been achieved uh, without uh, the monetary policy deployed by the, by the ECB. Also, the, uh, notwithstanding the, the compression of margins, there is a positive effect on volumes that needs to be taken into, into consideration. So the net effect uh, is, is not uh, easy to quantify. There have been analysis done by the colleagues in the central bank inside that uh, argue that uh, uh, the, the, the pros and cons are balanced, uh, but in any case, I mean, it, it is undeniable that there is a pressure on, uh, on bank margins. And that's why I, I focus very much on the need to uh, uh, bank management to uh, give close attention to their business models, to cost efficiency, to investment in technologies. We have seen that banks which have been most effective in investing in new technologies, bringing down the cost to income ratio, are also the banks which are achieve the highest level of profit. So banks need to deploy some self-help measures here. And conclusion of countries, again, I mean, I, we look at banks, we don't look at countries. I mean, the, the flag that is on the headquarters of the banks is not a very, very relevant issues for us. Of course, there could be specificities in the macroeconomic outlook in some countries that can affect also the banks in those countries, but that's not specifically our focus. So why don't we ju just go around here, please? In Genoa, FAZ, you said you will consider stepping up supervisory pressure. Uh, what would that be concrete? What would be uh, the pressure you will hold on the banks? As I said, already in, in, in this rep process, we have uh, uh, a number of measures. It's clear that we have been already pushing banks to, uh, to tackle issues uh, related to their cost efficiencies uh, and the like, for instance. Uh, we might consider, let's say, again, increasing our, if you look at the scores, for instance, in the business model, uh, they're probably uh, uh, still relatively high. So we might uh, reconsider whether these, uh, these scores are still appropriate, given the inability of the banks uh, to tackle issues that we have highlighted to their attention. So this could be, you know, gradually uh, come more into focus of our supervisory recommendations and our supervisory uh, scores and, uh, and assessments. We had uh, some in the middle here. Why don't we go to Nicholas Comfort here? Yeah, in the front, and then we go to the back. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Nicholas Comfort from Bloomberg News. I have two questions. The first is on, uh, um, the, on the, the P2R disclosures. Super helpful. Thank you also from, from, from us in the press. Um, now, interestingly enough, the I don't want to call them the Brexit banks, but sort of like some banks like Barclays, Ulster Bank, there are a couple of names there, who have interesting company in that they're, they're together with Greek banks, Italian banks, and not, not um, some Italian banks with, high, with more problems. 
Um, so does that reflect a fundamental risk you see in, in Brexit banks? And, um, and also, was it a question of you want to make, just make sure capital is here? Because these days, the world is splintering apart. And you want to make sure there's capital on hand locally. And what does this mean for, then for, the, for the other Brexit banks coming along as well? And then the other thing is, I mean, this is an incredible sentence you guys had today um, from, the, from the press release. Furthermore, some banks reported material losses which were mostly due to conduct risk events. This is 2020. We still have this. Um, this is, so I mean, I was wondering, in the conduct here, are we talking the legacy of litigation that many banks told us was behind them? Are we talking about rogue traders, which again, many banks told us were behind them? What exactly is that there? And how worrying is it that we're still dealing with these issues after the financial crisis? Thank you. Thank you. No, I, I wouldn't say that we have a specific, uh, I mean, for sure I would uh, rule out uh, most uh, energetically, let's say, that we are, let's say, using the, uh, the Pillar 2 requirements as a tool to ask banks uh, uh, coming post-Brexit, relocating post-Brexit, to have more capital here because we want to ring fence. That's definitely not, uh, uh, not the point. Let's say the, the, the Pillar 2 requirements are set with respect to the specific risk profiles of the banks, so there is not a, a homogeneous uh, Brexit bank category uh, which uh, deserve uh, a, higher, a higher capital requirements. Not at all. It's uh, uh, idiosyncratic individual banks, and uh, there is no specific, uh, let's say, narrative to be found there. Uh, on, um, on your point on conduct, yes, you are, you are, you are spot on there. I must say that uh, if you had asked me uh, three years ago a question like that, I would have probably said, yes, there is a pipeline no, of uh, you know, old uh, you know, mis-selling, old practices uh, which have been taken care of uh, through the reform process, uh, the tightening of the supervisory framework. Uh, actually, I see that this pipeline is not, not drying up. I mean, it's still, uh, still very dense. We still see a number of cases. Uh, many of the cases uh, which have been very relevant also in, uh, in 2019 have, uh, have relation uh, to uh, uh, money laundering, for instance, uh, concerns, uh, huge fines raised, uh, for instance, by U.S. authorities. So this is an area in which we uh, we, are, we are putting quite a lot of, uh, of attention. Also, from the product, we are not, as you know, a, a money laundering uh, super, an anti-money laundering supervisor. But from the impact that this could have on, uh, let's say, uh, on the banks in terms of stability and also for the, what it signals in terms of weaknesses in internal controls of co and governance, of course, these are areas we are paying a lot of attention to. So let's go in the middle, and then we'll come to you here in the the lady in the third row. Uh, Hannah Brenton from Politico. Um, I wanted to ask uh, two questions. Firstly, on leverage loans, I wondered how they factored into the SHREP process and if uh, any concerns have led directly to capital increases. And secondly, on the, the two banks that are still not meeting the Politico guidance, do they face any consequences in the meantime? Well, on your first question, the short answer is yes. Uh, so not in terms necessarily of the capital impact, but uh, there is, uh, I think that in a number of cases, uh, if I remember well, actually in, in 25 cases, there have been specific measures which have been taken with reference to uh, leverage loans. We've done uh, specific analysis, specific uh, deep dives in this area, and when we have found weaknesses, we have asked banks to take remedial measures. So this is uh, part of the exercise. Um, on the on the banks, yes, I, I, as I mentioned, yes, in the in the cases of the of the uh, banks of the two banks which have which actually uh, have not uh, uh, let's say. Uh, uh, are below the Pillar 2 guidance at the start of the year, uh, there have been specific capital plans which have been asked at the banks with a specific timeline for them to meet. Then there's a question right behind the lady, please. Martin Arnold, Financial Times. Hi, Andrea. Um, could I ask you uh, to be a bit more specific on the remedial actions that the ECB is requiring banks to take? Uh, and secondly, could you talk a bit more about what the uh, ECB can do and the supervisor can do to encourage more consolidation in the sector? 
Well, uh, the measures in general, let's say, uh, the, the qualitative measures in general have a, a wide array of, uh, of requirements. I mentioned, I focused a bit uh, in my presentation on those which focus on governance, uh, because these were the most uh, numerous in our, let's say, in, in, in the 2019 cycle. And uh, let's say they are focused in particular, I mean, I, I mentioned, for instance, internal controls, uh, uh, data aggregation issues, uh, uh, weaknesses in the, in the board. I mean, these are areas in which we ask very, bank by bank very specific uh, remedial measures. If you are referring to the measures on the two banks, I mean, these are capital plans. So if there is a shortfall in terms of uh, the capital position with respect to the uh, pillar two guidance, I mean, pillar two guidance, let me be clear here, is not a hardwired minimum. So banks are allowed to uh, go below that bar if there is a specific circumstance warranting it. I mean, it's a stressed requirement, so if the stress materializes for the bank, the bank can delve into the guidance. But in general, we expect the banks to set up a capital plan to reestablish, to replenish, let's say, the, uh, the, its, uh, its uh, um, uh, levels. Um, uh, the other question was on... Uh uh, consolidation. consolidation. Yeah, on consolidation, again, I mean, uh, consolidation is not up to us, you know, to push consolidation. Uh, we think there is a good economic rationale for, for consolidation in, ter in terms of uh, uh, there being excess capacity out there. The, the only point on which I could say that we might be helpful is that sometimes I hear out there the perception in markets that the ECB supervision uh, is negative on consolidation, so that whenever we see a deal, we tend to, you know, set the bar for capital relatively high, and that this discourages banks to even consider the prospects of consolidations. And I've been trying uh, to dispel this uh, this uh, this concern, and uh, uh, we plan to, let's say, clarify our policies on uh, how we use our powers in, uh, in, in, in this area, uh, and we will come out later this year with some clarification, for instance, on how we tra treat uh, bedwill, uh, how we look at uh, the capital adequacy of a bank, which of two banks which are merging, and the like. So we go to the front here, please. Francesco Canepa, Reuters. My question is about Isabel dos Santos and what's happening right now in Portugal. Um, she's getting out of Eurobic, so that's one thing sorted, but she still has commercial relations with um, some SSM supervised banks in Portugal. So what's your plan to do about those? Are you going to tell the banks to cut her off? And the second question is broader, um, it's still about that. So what are the lessons that you can draw? This woman was allowed to be a shareholder of a bank for many years, and so how happy are you about your performance there, and what are you going to change, and how happy are you about the Banco de Portugal's performance? So how, are you gonna, how do you plan not to repeat that mistake, basically? Well, as you, you will surely understand, I cannot uh, comment on a specific case, but let me say a few points which I think are relevant in this, in this area. Um, I mean, first of all, uh, fit and proper assessments um, are not uh, static one-off assessments. So whenever you have new information that comes up, let's say you uh, should be in a position to, uh, let's say, reassess uh, the status of certain uh, uh, shareholders or managers and, uh, and reconsider. I mean, that's something that we are doing more and more. Uh, for instance, we have started doing uh, board reviews. If you have a specific issue in a bank, uh, which is, for instance, uh, subject to uh, money laundering uh, or something like that, we can review. I mean, which members of the board were responsible for these functions? Did they perform well? Did they do a good job? And if not, we can take action there. The second point I want to make, how happy uh, I am, uh, I am not very happy, to be honest. I'm not very happy not about the performance, ours or Banco de Portugal performance. I'm not very happy about the uh, relative uh, uh, I mean there is no better term that comes to me mess than mess in the in the in the in the legislative uh, uh, setup here I mean it's very difficult uh, uh, for us uh, to do uh, fit and proper assessment in a, in a proper in a proper way I mean there are uh, this is an area which is one of the least harmonized 
throughout the Union, which means that we have to apply a set of very different uh, local provisions, local implementation of European rules in each member state in the banking union. This means that we can very well come out with assessments in some cases which are not positive, but we cannot act because the local legislation does not give us the tool, let's say, to intervene. And I'm not pleased with that at all, to be honest. Um, another point which is important to me is that uh, in some, in some uh, countries, you, can, you have the possibility to do ex-ante assessments. In other countries, you can only do ex-post assessments. Also, that is something that we don't like. I mean, basically, we would like uh, to have, first of all, a, a common way of doing the assessments across the board and, uh, and, uh, and to have this done ex-ante so that we can provide a filter on who goes in the, share, in the ownership structure of banks, in the board of banks. So uh, not very happy. So I think there was, yes, a question by the lady here in the third row, Isabella Bufaki. Uh, <clears throat> Isabella Bufaki, Il Sole 24 Ore. Um, you said you were uh, surprised when you arrived at um, the SSM about the internal controls on risk for banks, and they're not adequate enough. Can you give us an idea of what kind of risks that banks stumble on, which are the risks in this particular case for internal controls that are harder for banks to, to assess? And then um, if, if um, you cannot comment on specific banks, but maybe on a country um, uh, question on non-performing loans, as you're satisfied on uh, aggregate level, but um, would you say that also Italian banks, are you satisfied with what they've done up to now? Uh, and I suppose, I don't know, there, there probably are Italian banks in the 32. Thank you. Well, uh, the, the point I was referring to was specifically on, on, on the data side, no, on the data quality. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I mean, whenever uh, seeing, let's say, results of on-site inspections, for instance, in many cases you have a number of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, very high relevance findings which are in the area of data quality. And this reflects a number of issues. I mean, just uh, uh, sloppiness, pure internal, uh, pure internal organization of data, uh, but also, let's say, in many cases, uh, very old uh, legacy IT system, end of life IT systems, which is a problem at a, at a number of banks across, uh, across our jurisdiction. And when you don't have enough uh, good data, of course, it's also difficult for the control functions yeah, to look what, to see what's going on in the banks, where are potential risks, and to take uh, uh, preventive actions uh, soon enough. No? So these two points are very strongly related. I mean, we mentioned the point of data aggregation system, um, uh, data aggregation capabilities at banks, no? This is, I, I think I sent a letter to the bankers uh, uh, mm -hmm. mid last year. I mean, this is a specific requirement of the Basel Committee, which we find is very poorly implemented by European banks. This means that you cannot, you're not even able to aggregate the positions across all the establishments, so the subsidiaries, the branches uh, in, your, in your group, and give a very, very fast and clear understanding of how much risk you have in a certain area. I mean, that's something which is unacceptable from a supervisory perspective. On NPLs, as I said, I mean, there is uh, good, uh, good progress, and, uh, and these concerns, uh, I must say, concerns banks across the board. I wouldn't give a specific connotation. I think Italian banks have done a, a very significant, I mean, they, they explained a lot of the, of the decrease in, in 2000. Uh, uh, 19, also because the, let's say, the amount, the stock was quite high, and still is, um, uh, but also banks in other countries were very much in line and sometimes overachieved the target, so that's something very positive. Any other questions? Yes, here in the middle, please. Can you get a microphone there, please? Michael Rasch, NZZ. Uh, you mentioned that a lot of banks, or the majority of banks, um, don't earn their cost of capital. Um, isn't this the basis uh, for further trouble in the future? And what can the ECB do in this area to improve uh, the things? Well, the fact that uh, most banks uh, don't manage to get uh, their cost of capital means also that there are a number of banks that do. 
So there are banks which have been able you know, to actually uh, uh, earn their cost of capital, to have uh, uh, return on equity in double digit, which managed to, to bring the, uh, uh, the, the cost to income ratios, for instance, uh, uh, very low. I mean, we have the cost to income of uh, European banks, which is stuck around 66% uh, since a long while. I mean, uh, it's clear that uh, if you are in, in this environment, I mean, that's why I mentioned self-help measures. I mean, the external environment in terms of interest rates, in terms of uh, macroeconomic outlook, uh, uh, in terms of competition, is not going to get better in the short term. So banks need really to focus on the levers that they have in their, in their hands. We made an, a, a survey. Um, a couple of years ago, I think it was, on uh, profitability of banks, which showed that uh, uh, the banks that were better in, 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 uh, in, uh, in uh, achieving higher profitability were the banks uh, that uh, had a, a better strategic steer. So again, it's uh, boards, managers that need to understand what, are the, what drives their profits, refocus their business models in the areas where they, where they can make money, uh, trim down other areas, reduce uh, costs, and achieve greater cost efficiency. And we've seen also that uh, investment in ITs, so the ability to you know, uh, use ITs in an uh, in effective way, both in terms of uh, uh, back office, in a sense, and in terms of distribution strategies, is also another important uh, lever to, 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 to consider. Any other questions? I don't know. That one last one here in the front. Andreas Kröner, Handelsblatt. Uh, you mentioned uh, consolidation before. Um, do you have any signs that there is uh, some consolidation to happen? Because in the last couple of years, we haven't seen much of that. And what do you think are the main reasons that there hasn't happened much in terms of consolidation in the last years? Thanks. Well, that's, that's a good question. Um, well, um, I mean, uh, there are signals that uh, uh, bank management are considering uh, more, possibly, uh, consolidation strategies. So far, they have, cons they have not really uh, taken this up. Uh, there are two types of uh, consolidation strategies we can uh, consider. No, one is uh, sort of in-market consolidation, so when you target uh, uh, cost reductions and uh, efficiency increases. So that's where you, you, you basically try to have uh, a consolidation between banks which have overlapping distribution networks, for instance. Uh, and this generally would be domestic no? uh, type, of, uh, uh, type of mergers. We have seen some of them. Uh, not many, but we have seen uh, some of them. Maybe not high profile, not catching the headlines, but we have seen some of them. And uh, sometimes we see also some uh, discussions that can uh, bring to further uh, developments in this, uh, in this area. Uh, or you can have uh, uh, more cross-border type of consolidation, so consolidation that uh, uh, target uh, revenue diversification, which is also very positive from us as supervisors because, of course, it gives you more um, ability to uh, um, diversify risks, no? and which means that if you have an idiosyncratic shock in one country, you would be able to withstand it better because you are, you, you, your profits are generated in different, uh, in different markets. This type of consolidation so far has been hampered to a large extent also by, let's say, legislative uh, constraints or policy constraints. So there have been a number of uh, uh, legislative measures, for instance, that have not allowed banks to perform uh, asset and liability management on a cross-border basis, with, even within the euro area, even where you have a single supervisor, a single resolution authority, a single resolution fund, but still you have uh, differences in which uh, uh, within country asset and liability management is performed and cross-border. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the main issue that I think uh, uh, should be addressed going forward. And, uh, and there have been a number, a number of other impediments. For instance, the, some national discretions on large exposures 
that prevent the banks uh, from, uh, you know, centralized funding, no, and then uh, have, have it uh, operated in an integrated fashion for the group as a whole within the, the euro area. So this reduces the benefits of diversifying your business cross-border and makes the case for cross-border consolidation more complicated. Uh, but I cannot rule out that, the, I mean, there are also some business areas uh, in which uh, maybe not for, again, high profile business combinations, you can still see interesting opportunities for deals. I mean, there are some lines of business which are, um, um, in which scale is very important. Take custody business, uh, investment banking. So in those areas, maybe banks could consider also aggregation projects. So we'll have to see, wait and see. The only point, as I said before, that, I, that is key, I'm keen to, to make is that, uh, let's say, uh, uh, there is no supervisory impediment, at least, no impediment that we want to throw into the, into the uh, way of consolidation from the supervisory side. Of course, we will always ask that banks that uh, want to engage into consolidation process have a good uh, business plan and uh, have a, a capital uh, trajectory that is uh, ensuring us that they will always be, uh, let's say, respecting the requirements. Any other questions, any last questions? No? I think we've then satisfied all questions. Very good. Thank you very much for coming, and we will close the press conference here. Thank you. Thank you.